To save Superman in the Justice League, Batman and Wonder Woman will have to make the dangerous trek to Apocalypse. Can they rescue their friends? Well, let's hop into the pages of Dark Knight's Death Metal issue number three and find out. So then, as the comic opens up, we are on the blighted hellscape known as Apocalypse, normally home to Darkseid and the evil New Gods, but now seemingly home to a whole different crop of evil cosmic Batman from the Dark Multiverse. You got Batrocidus, the Red Lantern, you got the Night Glider, and even a Brainiac version of Batman, too. They're looking over the wreckage of the ship that was launched at the end of the previous issue, and they find no signs of life inside. Well, except for Jonah Hex, but because he's a zombie, he doesn't ping their sensors. Hex is all part of a bigger distraction plan, though, as Wonder Woman, Batman, and Harley Quinn all make trails to where they're currently holding Superman. And again, if you needed some not-so-subtle reminding, Death Metal, despite the very serious, very aggressive name, is much more of a schlocky comedy than the original Dark Knight's Metal ever was. Case in point, Batman and Harley Quinn managed to bring a giant motorcycle and a giant mutant hyena into space, and to get to Superman's prison cell, they have to fight their way past not evil Robins, not parademons, but para-Robins. And naturally, the para-Robins also just so happen to talk like Burt Ward from the Adam West 60s Batman show. Holy death, Batman! Now, what kind of prison and what kind of jailer would be strong enough to hold the last son of Krypton? Well, to answer those questions in order, the prison was forcibly built by Mr. Miracle. The new god and greatest escape artist the universe has ever seen. The place is outfitted with a bunch of different colors of of kryptonite that Superman has never seen before from the Dark Multiverse. And should he try and end his torture by escaping, his cells will slowly die off and be replaced with Darkseid cells, basically turning him into a new version of Darkseid. Now, why would the Batman who laughs go through all the trouble of turning everyone in the universe into Dark Batman like himself, only to have Superman turn into a Darkseid who could potentially try and overthrow him? Well... The only answer I can really come up with goes a little something like... Because it's cool. Now, speaking of Darkseid and I was, Superman's jailer and the head of this new apocalypse turns out to be a guy called Darkfather, an evil amalgamation of Batman and Darkseid, and I guess a little Highfather, too. He's probably the only character who doesn't know this is a comedy and as such takes this opportunity to wax poetic to an imprisoned Superman about the nature of Batman and Superman across the multiverse. Or how it seems that almost every evil version of Batman out there became some sort of world-destroying villain while every evil version of Superman became some sort of world-conquering tyrant. And that perhaps somewhere in there it reflects Clark and Bruce's own views on humanity, Superman fearing that the only way to actually save mankind from themselves was to rule them, while Batman, representing more of the human experience already, figures that mankind is gonna eat each other already, so why not just speed that up a little bit? Luckily, the good guys managed to show up and put a stop to this impromptu college thesis, but Dark Father isn't going to go down that easily, he has himself an ace up his sleeve. Get the this, an Omega Sanction gun. One that when he shoots it at our Batman will zero in on his genetic makeup and completely erase him from all of recorded history instead of just sending him back to relive his past lives. And if you're thinking, wait, if they get rid of Prime Batman, shouldn't that mean all the other Batman from the Dark Multiverse disappear? Don't worry, Dark Father thought of that. Don't ask how he solved that problem, but he did. Batman ends up tanking a shot from the gun anyway, but don't worry, it doesn't kill him because, well, he's Batman and he planned ahead and he thought for that. Furthermore, Superman manages to break out of his prison and he's fine too. Because, and follow me on this one, Batman was able to use his newly found Black Lantern ring to tell all of Superman's dying cells to basically just not die and not become Darkseid. Yeah, that makes sense! And if you think that's a stupid answer, don't worry because this is a comedy and the characters within the story itself also think that it's a stupid answer. In fact, they further seek to imply that maybe Batman and Superman have even darker reasons as to why that didn't work. Reasons that they're desperately trying to keep from Wonder Woman, the person who is for the most part the de facto main character on the good guy side this time around. But hey, that's not all we got going on because over in the B story, the Robin King actually ends up finding where the JSA and the Flashes have been hiding out. No one really takes this crazy little kid seriously, and they shouldn't, but where the Robin King goes, the Darkest Knight is not far behind. The Darkest Knight has come to salvage the last bit of crisis energy from Wally West, and doing so making himself powerful enough to fight Perpetua. 
With very few options left, the three generations of Flash do what they do best, and that is, well, run really fast away from the problem. Again, you want to know more about what's going on here? It seems that they're going to be getting a tie-in soon, so be sure to read it. Now, back with the Trinity, they finally managed to dig deep on down into Apocalypse's prison cells and rescue the rest of the Justice League, who seem to be pretty fine despite the fact that they were being held captive. They look only lightly tortured. With the good guys all finally back together, they're ready to plan their next course of action. They're going to split up like this with Scooby-Doo. One gang is going to attempt to cut Perpetua off from her power at her throne room. Go read Justice League if you want to see how that goes. While well, the main characters we've been following right now are going to actually try and sneak back into the dark multiverse to find the power they need to actually re-kickstart their own universe from scratch. The key to all of these plans, though, turns out to be none other than Jaro, the little piece of Starro that Batman had picked up and adopted and started raising like a son in the main Scott Snyder Justice League book. Man, to think that that weird comedy bit from that book comes back here and actually feels way more at home. Jaro is naturally the most powerful psychic being in the universe right now, and as such will be able to provide cover for the good guys so the Darkest Knight can't track them. So yeah, it would seem like the battle lines are all nice and drawn here, good versus evil, except for the fact that there's a third party involved in all of this. You'll recall for the first couple issues we've been checking on in with Lobo. He'd been terrassing around the universe, causing his regular kind of Zarnian destruction and chaos, but as we discover this issue, as he shoots up the fifth dimension... He's actually on the clock right now. He's been hired by someone to get this, gather a bunch of little boxes very similar to the one Green Arrow was given in the main Justice League book. Which, if you know me, I've been asking for so long now, and say it with me if you know the words. It's in the box! What's in the fucking box? Well, guess what? In this issue, we actually get closer to an answer than ever before. You see, Lex Luthor, who is still very much alive on Earth and in the ruins of the Legion of Doom's headquarters, tells Lobo that those boxes contain the death metal, which Luthor vows will be the key to his revenge on all of those who wronged him as the comic comes to a close. And so, that was Dark Knight's death metal issue number three, and once again, it's a wacky, madcap, schlocky comedy superhero story. In fact, the longer this storyline goes on and the more time I have to think about it, really, Death Metal, despite its harder, edgier, modern trappings, really has more in common with the silly Silver Age comic stories. Which, for that alone, I gotta say, Scott Snyder might very well be a genius tricking a bunch of people into reading a Silver Age comic story because they thought it was going to be something, you know, more serious and adult. When in truth, the whole thing is kind of a farce. A funny farce, but one that I know is not gonna be everyone's cup of tea, and if I know anything about comic fans, a lot of them, once they realize they've kind of been bait-and-switched, they kind of just clam up and never give the story another chance after that, which I feel is pretty much what's going on here. Overall, though, I feel comfortable giving this one a 7.5 out of 10. There's definitely fun to be had here. A lot of the tie-ins that we're gonna be reading until at least January get set up here in this issue, and some of them certainly look fun. I don't know how in important they're going to be to the overall story, but there you go. Ultimately, I'd feel comfortable giving this one a 7.5 out of 10. I don't know if it's as much of a page turner as the original Dark Knight's Metal, but you know, it's certainly different, and I gotta give it credit for that. Hey there everyone, Kate Joel again, and I just want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. And hey, if you enjoyed the book I covered in this issue and want some comics of your own, might I recommend Book Depository? It's my number one place for shopping for comic book trades. You get a great price, and if you use my link down in the description, you'll actually be helping me out at the same time. You get something, I get something, everybody wins, right? So until next time, everyone, I've been Joel, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.